All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, uh, welcome to the session on clickers, the use of clickers to uh, engage your students and assess. My name's uh, Greg McNeil. I'm a professor at the law school. I also teach um, at the School of Public Policy. This is my uh, fifth year of teaching, maybe sixth year, depending on if you count the um, a fellowship, uh, and my second year at, at Pepperdine. Um, Let's just hop right into things, uh, and I'll go through the overview sort of as we as we go through the presentation. Um, first, let me go over sort of the equipment overview, and we have some clickers for you to use. Um, and this is just like what would happen with your students at the law school. We have a central. The law school purchased clickers. We have the students go to the library. They sign their clicker out, and at the end of the year, they have to return the clicker. The clickers run about forty dollars. The the technical name for clickers is response cards, but everybody just calls them clickers. Um, and so we have a process at the law school where we hand them out and we collect them. Uh, in prior years, uh, what we did was the students would go to the bookstore and buy it just like a book. Uh, some of them would buy it on eBay. We found that it was easier for us to centrally control it. And also we thought it that one additional technology course was, uh, cost was unfair to the students. And so working with the, with the university, we were able to, uh, we were able to get a, our own set of, of clickers for use in the classroom. And so uh, this is just what your students will have. They'll sign out at the beginning of the semester a clicker, just like you're having a clicker handed to you. And it will be theirs for the semester. It has a unique serial number, um, so we know uh, if they lose theirs or try and turn someone else's in. Uh, we, can, we can track that kind of information. So that's the student side. I'll talk about that piece of technology in a second. The professor side, the technology here is really minimal. Um, there's a receiver which will plug into your computer. Um, on my computer, it is this gray thing. It's the same thing you see up there. It just plugs into a USB slot. Um, it, uh, it, the computer automatically recognizes that, um, that receiver. So there's nothing special you have to do. It's simple. You take it, you plug it into the computer, and it works, which is great because most of us don't have the time to deal with things that don't work right. Um, and so that's one of the great features here. Um, second is the turning technology software. I'll kind of go into it in a second, but it's basically an add-on to PowerPoint. So if you know how to use PowerPoint, you know how to use the turning technology software. You install it. The only difference is when you open your PowerPoint slides, you click on a turning technologies icon that just opens your PowerPoint and all it's done is added an extra menu into your PowerPoint with a couple extra features. So if you're familiar with the insert graphic ribbon or insert something else, this is super easy if you can make PowerPoint. So if you're already using PowerPoint in your class and you've been using PowerPoint in your classes for a while, there's not a lot extra that you have to add. You have to change your way of thinking about some things, which I'll talk about in a second, but there's not a lot extra that you have to really do, which is great. It's, this is an easy tech integration. Some, some tech integrations, I think, are more challenging. Um, changing sort of your, your pedagogical approach with iPads and other things can be hard. I think this is an easy first step to integrating technology in your classroom. And again, the student, they just have one thing. So um, let me talk about the tech that you have in front of you. Little clicker, it's familiar to many of your students. It's a standard keypad, although now many of them are used to um, on-screen keyboards, but it's, a, uh, it's the keypad just like you would have on a phone. When they enter their response on that screen, you see here in the example 5E, if they see 5E, that means that they hit the 5 button, it was received by my computer, and it's confirmed. So they have confidence to know that their answer was, was received by me. Um, and if for some reason um, they d their answer is not received, they'll get a little, uh, no it's like a do not smoke uh, sign, the little circle with a line through it to let them know that, that it wasn't received. And they can mention it to me, um, or at least they're aware of it for later on, and they'll try and square something away. Usually the thing that is the biggest problem is that they're on the wrong channel. There's a channel button there. You can change the channel. By default, it's on 41. By default, my receiver's on 41. The only reason you'd ever be on a different channel is you're running clickers in more than one classroom. If we're blessed to have that problem, we'll deal with changing channels. But right now, usually at the law school, I'm the only person running clickers at any given point in time. We're hoping to expand that. So that's the equipment, right? It took a long time to talk through that slide, but the equipment is a clicker, software that's running on your computer, and a receiver. I mean, for going to class, I pick my laptop up, the receiver's always plugged in, I walk down there, I plug it in, um, 
students brought their clickers and we're ready to go. No big burdens on the logistics side. All right, so let's try your clickers out. We're going to jump right into this. This is how easy it is. So here's the question. At Pepperdine, I'm primarily affiliated with, so find who you're primarily affiliated with and hit your button. And you should be 14 of you, I'm already seeing the responses. So what's great about this is up here in the, uh, up here you've got polling open. This lets me know that the slide is now ready to receive. I can set that to closed and open it when I want if for some reason I don't want people to be able to start responding right away. And then I can see that 22 people have already responded. So if I know that I have a class of 26 people, which is how many were registered for this class session, that included me, so that knocks it down to 25, um, then I know that there are three people who might be absent or they're Google surfing or they're G chatting or they're buying some shoes on eBay or whatever. I know some people aren't paying attention. And I watch that number because I kind of get an idea of who's around. Um, in the spring, what I did was I took a test. Are you here? And the only answer you could give was yes because I found that when I put yes or no, some people thought they were cute and they would answer no, which I didn't understand because the attendance was counting against you. Why would you do that? Um, and uh, one of the features I could do was have a little flag. That, so it was fun. Everybody was there, and the flag started counting up. But then people were showing up late, and I was the mean professor who was forcing people to be in class on time. I had one student tell me that if I knew you were going to enforce that policy, which you didn't put in the syllabus, I would have registered for a different class. As if you need to put, like, being on time requirement of the class. Um, in any case, that was great because I could see that from class to class, if I knew I had 60 students in the class enrolled every class session at the beginning, I'd do the attendance count and I'd know 58. And I wouldn't have to wait till my number got up there to figure out who I, who I was at. Now, um, here's the great feature. You already, I have 22 of you have already responded. And instantly, I click to close the polling and I get an instant answer. I don't have to wait to generate a graph or a chart or anything. All I did was insert a polling slide into this software, um, just like I would insert a regular PowerPoint slide. I put in the, the title, um, I put in the options, you filled out your answers, the 22 of you, and now we instantly get a distribution of where everyone's from. I could code this slide, one of the features, settings I could do, would be to make whatever answer you gave affiliated with your clicker from now until the end of the semester. So I could do, are you male or female? And you would say, one male, and let's say your clicker number is ABC123, ABC123 from now on would always be affiliated with mail, which would be great because as I build that information about my students over time, I would then be able to export a report that says, are men doing better at this question than women? Are minorities answering this question differently uh, than non-minority students? Um, are students who are in their second year answering this differently than in their fourth year? Have you taken a prerequisite or a recommended prerequisite for this course? And are you now not, is the student who didn't take the prerequisite not performing as well on my in-class assessments as they otherwise would? If you asked me to do that as a professor without some form of technology and an easy way to do it, I would want to light myself on fire. But because I could just ask the question and then track over time how to do this, I can tie this into all kinds of demographic assessment stuff that I would want to do that otherwise would be difficult. But I have a challenge right now because all you, I know about you are that you are clicker number ABC123. I want to know who you actually are. And we know we have a, a class roster. Um, and so right now I'm stuck though with identity, 025D1B. That's the unique clicker ID number. Not very helpful to me as a professor because I don't know how to tie that to a person. So I could have an assistant go through and person by person have the student come in and report in and email in their number. And chances are someone will email in the FCC ID and someone will email in the ACN ID and someone will email in something else. And a bunch of students just won't even email anything in at all, even if I told them it was worth 20% of their grade because they were busy or they forgot or whatever and they'd want an exception. So the software allows me to have, make an end run around this, which is um, there's a one-time registration that you could do. I say one time. You, you could do it as many times as you want, but you could do an upfront registration process. Um, it's called a real-time registration that allows me to just walk over to my computer and on the, on the first day of class or whenever I decide to do the registration, I can open up a thing known as the real-time uh, registration tool. Let's see. 
um, as soon as I remember how to do this. Okay. Real-time registration tool. Now, those of you who pre-registered for this class were my class roster, or um, you get the class roster at the beginning of the semester with all of the names, um, and they're already pre-populated. Uh, all the student has to do is now hit a button. So Gregory McNeil, I'm number seven. When my name is up there, I hit seven on my keypad. I, my clicker has now been associated with my name on the back end. There's also a feature that I wouldn't even have to create this list. So I just took that spreadsheet and uh, imported it into Turning Point. But there's a feature that allows you to do this through courses slash Sakai so that you would be able to just import the class roster directly from Sakai um, and use that as part of the registration. And along with that, it would carry whatever data courses decided to uh, decided to align with the person's identity, which is a really good feature. Um, so I'm going to open this up so you can all see what happens here. Um, and here's our attendance thing, right? I, four people aren't going to answer plus me. So five people aren't going to answer because I had 26 registrants, um, which we'll come back to that in a second. So once you see your name, just go ahead and, and hit your key. Um, and you'll be able to register. So uh, Jane would hit eight, Phil would hit nine, Phil, Phil, tisk, tisk, where's Phil? Um, Shelly would hit zero. Are you having problems, Shelly? Is it not working? There we go, okay. Um, and so you can see how this works straight on through. The, it takes up, you know, depending on the size of your class, it takes a little bit of time, um, as you can see here. When's the right time for me to do this? And usually what I do is I say, you know, there are only a few more seconds left. Um, now, here's where the, the fun and games can come in that gets a little frustrating. Um, Someone thinks it's funny to hit six and take Edwin's spot away. And so it clears Edwin out. And then the next time they hit six, all of a sudden, 6B57D, Phil Bowl becomes Edwin Cahill. There's some opportunity for people to play around there. Except every time they do that, they've now deregistered themselves as a participant and registered as someone else. So every time they're participating in class, someone else is getting credit for it. So you just tell them, you probably want this to be right. Uh, you're not helping yourself by taking away the way you would uh, register for participation. Let's just click through this pretty quickly. So now we have, uh, we can do the same thing here. Uh, again, now uh, the limitation being you only have 10 keys on the keyboard, so that's why we can't do, you know, one to 100 all at once. And I'll give it a few more seconds. Gary, are you here? And now we'll go to the next one. And go now, let's say student, you know, Mike Mullen or someone, or Gary Selby, leaves during this time and goes to the bathroom. Um, and now their name is not affiliated with the, the, the roster. And they come in and they're, they're freaking out. Professor, I know that this... I didn't click in, and I'm not on your roster, and, and I'm just, you know, I really need to get a good grade in this class because of all these things that I need to have happen in my life. And you go, it's okay. Every time you answer, it'll be affiliated with your clicker ID number on my back end on the spreadsheet. So just do me a favor. Send me an email with the device ID from the back of your clicker, um, and, I'll, and I'll get you synced up with my roster. And now, it's a little bit of an extra burden on your part, but it was easy to solve. That is to say, when they answer, even if they're not affiliated with this roster, you're still tracking it. It's just tracking as 56A2C5 instead of as Tim Lucas until you go into the spreadsheet and next to Tim Lucas's name, type in manually the code number. So nothing's ever lost. As long as the system receives the command, it's logged into the system. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, so then we just close up the registration. Um, I've now got that. If I close this out, it will save this to the participant list. And so now this is my participant list um, here. Uh, technology learning conference list. Here's the list. So now if, uh, if uh, Oliver comes in and tells me, hey, listen, my device ID is ABC123, I would just type in ABC123 or Oliver emails me, and that's how I can add it in. So it's really not hard to keep this uh, to keep this up to date. Um, all right, let me jump back into the presentation. So now, after the one-time registration, we have a new thing, that, a new feature here that comes up. So let's try a new question. Pepperdine University will be a preeminent global Christian university known for the integration of faith and learning, whose graduates lead purposeful lives as servant-minded leaders throughout the world. All of you read this before coming here, thus, thus being prepared for class today. But I'm wondering, how many of you really read it? 
And so I know I assign things. And I can get a ballpark from, you know, I have 22 people in this class. I can sort of ping people. Based on the discussion, I can hope to, that you've all done it and that you get it and you've committed it to memory. Or I can actually find out. Now, I could pass out paper quizzes, but why not just put it up on a slide and see where we're at? I could do a show of hands. Usually when I do a show of hands, if I have 22 people, I say, how many people say one? Two people raise their hand. How many people say two? One, people raise, one person raises their hand. I go through each of it, and when, I'm not a math guy, but when I do the math, somehow I only have 10 responses for 22 people, because nobody wants to raise their hand, because they're, they don't want to raise their hand, they're over it, or they're just, not, they're just not engaged. This forces them to be engaged, and they know I'm tracking them. So right now, for example, polling's open. Only nine of you have responded. And I can, go over to my, uh, I can go over to my computer and wonder why I haven't seen any more responses. And so I can actually hit this, what I've moused over here called the non-response grid, or I just hit the F8 key, and, uh, oh wait, uh, the F7 key. And now I get the names of who has or has not responded. And so as you're coming down to the end of the poll, you're like, Katie, what's going on? Where are you? I, I need an answer here. I'm closing up. So now we've gone from numbers that I know, I need 22 responses or 20 responses, to names. This is great in law school because law school is one exam at the end and it's anonymous. Um, this is not anonymous. And it's professor now knows that you're here, but you ain't participating. Or if the name is up there, you're not even here. And so if every class session, Greg McNeil's name's up there, because I didn't register. Uh, Greg McNeil's name is, is up there as a person who is not answering a question. Every class session, everybody knows that when we get to the end of it, where's McNeil? What's his problem? Oh, he's not here again. And it might not be, I might not do anything with that. But that sort of cognitive reality that your name's going to be up on the board as a non-responder, um, uh, can really affect people's, uh, affect people's minds. And so um, here's the, here, let's close it up and see what, the, uh, what, what the, everyone says. The Pepperdine mission statement is, was the number one answer. Um, number two came in as the vision statement. Um, nobody thought this was the affirmation statement. And a bunch of you were confused by the WASC type terms I threw at you. All right, so let's see what the actual correct answer is. It's actually it's the Pepperdine vision statement. And so now, Everybody in this class did their homework. They went through an employee training. And now I know that while I, re I actually thought this was going to be like 80% like of the class was going to be over here. I really thought that. Um, because this doesn't talk about anything about like lives of purpose, service, and you know, whatever. I, see, I don't even know the mission statement. Um, so this lesson, I would pause for a moment. Normally, I'd blow through. Everybody knows the vision statement from the mission statement. But now as an instructor, I can stop and say, oh, I thought we had that. But really, 75% of the class doesn't get it. Maybe I need to spend a little bit more time here. Now, if, I was, if it was the other way, 75% the other way, I would move on. And I think many of us have seen in our teaching evaluations, professor wastes lots of time on simple stuff and doesn't spend any time on the hard stuff. Um, and year after year, we keep going into what we think is the really hard stuff and they get, and we blow through the stuff that's simple. This is the way to just check that. Right away, you know. Um, okay, so let me keep uh, uh, moving here. So, okay, um, where was it? Now, you can add in this, which is, who was the fastest responder who actually got it right? <laughs> which, it's a nice little way to reward the people who are paying attention and are quick on the draw, and if you're struggling to start with a discussion, I've got five people that I can go to. Hey, participant 6C800, tell me how you were able to distinguish this from the mission statement. And what does it mean to you? What does this vision statement mean to you? Now it's a launching point. And that person's going to be willing to talk to me because they feel good about the fact that they were, they were tops. I'm recognizing them for being good. I'm bringing them in. And other people might be thinking, man, I'd like to be that person too. Now, our, our introverts in the class are going to think, I'm going to be slow on the draw because I don't want to be, I know that he always calls on people if they're quick. And that's fine too because that plays into their learning style. I know the answer. I'm confident in the answer. But I'm going to wait for a second because I just don't feel comfortable talking. But that person's still participating. If I just did a class where it was raise your hands, the same people who always raise their hands would be raising their hands. And the people who never raise their hands because they're not comfortable, it wouldn't feel engaged. This allows introverts to be silently engaged while allowing the extroverts to get that attention that they crave and maybe brings in the people who are in the middle. 
Um, and so this is, this, you don't have to have this slide, it's just an extra one you can add. You add insert fastest responder slide, boom, it appears right after the slide that you had up there. Um, all right, so let's try a real example from, from Crim Law. On here on the right hand side is my hypothetical. And on the left is what I want my students to know. And you can all know this. You don't have to have been a law student to figure this out. It's like day two of law school. So there are four kinds of killings, four kinds of homicides um, that, that the students will study. These are simplified definitions. The most serious is what we think of as premeditated and deliberate killings, planned out killings, first degree murder. You thought about it, you planned it out, you went out and you did it. I'm simplifying. Second degree would, would be, you did it, you meant to do it, you intended to do it. Oh, there's Shelly. I don't like Shelly, I kill Shelly, right? I didn't plan it out. I wasn't waiting for Shelly. So it's probably more second degree murder than first degree murder. Reckless manslaughter would be, here I am, the way I present, and I'm throwing around my, my, my clicker, and I know my clicker has a blade on it, and I disregard the risk that my clicker might kill Shelly. You're just going to keep getting killed, Shell. Um, and that flies out of my hand. I'm aware of the risk. I disregard it, and there it kills Shelly. And then finally, there's the negligent version, right, where I know there's a risk I might, uh, I don't know there's a risk that I might kill Shelly by throwing this around, but everybody else in the world would know it. So I wasn't aware of the risk myself, consciously, but a reasonable person would have been aware of the risk of sort of tossing a knife around or a knife-laden clicker. Uh, okay, so you've got the hierarchy. Here's our hypo. You got Victor. Victor the victim. Easy to remember, right? Killed in a car accident after Mr. Carr rear-ends him. Uh, Carr admits, Carr states, I was mad about the vehicle that Victor the victim sold me. And Carr admits, I wanted to wreck his car. He says, I bumped Victor's car on Big Mountain with the goal of running his rear, ruining his rear axle and leaving him stuck on the mountain. So I rammed his car. I just wanted to ruin his car. But what ended up happening was I rammed his car. He spun off the road down into the canyon, and he died. And I went to the police, and I turned myself in, and I confessed because I wanted the police to know I didn't mean any harm. So we've got some facts here that tell us something about where we might be on this spectrum. And so to be able to prove any of these crimes, what I would want my students to know is that it would be possible to prove these crimes so long as some evidence exists for each of the elements. So look at this fact pattern, look at the definitions, and think to yourself, is there, not if you're convinced, is there some evidence to satisfy the definitions that are up there? And these are in a hierarchy. First degree is the most serious, negligent manslaughter is the least serious from top to bottom. So, Think in your mind, which of these crimes, the mo what's the most serious crime for which there's some evidence that it's possible you might get a conviction for? You think about that, and now let's actually see where the, where the class comes out on finding evidence here and applying it over to this side. So using the knowledge they should already have about the definitions when they showed up to class, taking a new hypothetical and testing their, their knowledge, testing their ability to apply what they've learned to some new fact circumstance. All right, so let's try it out. The highest level homicide offense that Carr could be found guilty of is, which of these do you think it is? Let's, uh, let's run through our listing here. Waiting on two people, maybe two more, 22 I think I had. There we go, and so I'll stop there. Now, you'll notice that this is a little different orientation than before. You can change, you can do pie graphs, you saw the pie graph, you can do bar charts up and down. You can also do bar charts left and right. And so the highest level offense that everyone thinks Carr could be found guilty of is reckless manslaughter. Now, the correct answer is the highest level offense he could be found guilty of is first degree murder because he said, I was mad, he said I went and rammed his car, and it's possible that the jury will disbelieve all of his self-serving statements, right? We don't have to believe what's said. That's a part of the lesson that you guys didn't get, which is, uh, which, which is the, the proof requirement and what a jury might or might not believe. But this is actually great. So um, Provost Tippins was talking a little bit about like, the ability to be like, sort of like flexible and uh, see what happens. I actually would have thought everybody would have, again, I would have thought everybody went into category two at least, second degree murder, and I really thought everyone would have come in at first degree murder, which reveals just sort of my bias as a professor about sort of what I quickly 
instructed everyone on and what I expected everyone. So this blows my expectations out of the water. But I'm not like upset. Like I, I think the first few times I did this, I would have been upset. But now I'm like, great, this is a teaching moment. Everybody's saying reckless manslaughter. If I blew through this thinking that everybody thought it was first degree murder, without checking where we're at our collective knowledge, nobody would get the fact that my question is, could be found guilty of, which just asks us, is there some evidence? It's not asking, what do you think? That is a huge distinction that, that actually distinguishes my C students from my A students. Their ability to get that. And this is like class three, early in the semester. So if I got a result like this with students who did all of the readings, you know, I'm not holding, this, this is, you guys just are in here just for a second. Um, if they did all the readings and I got this result, I'd say, whoa, I lost it somewhere. Somewhere I lost the class. They're not, they're not making the connections that I need. And I would go into a diversion here to talk about could be found guilty of the highest level offense. Some evidence in there could prove it. And basically say, listen, the jury's, jury doesn't have to believe this person. And so this first degree would be a possibility. All right, so gold star for those who put first degree murder. Um, so you can give that, you, know, you can do a smiley face, you can do the box around, whatever the correct, the correct answer is. So, I mean, that's amazing. 5% of the class um, would have got that right. Okay, so fastest responder, 6C800. Who are you, 6C800? Okay, so um, now what do you personally think? This is different, right? So you're looking, you're the juror. You're listening to this evidence. Carr says, you know, I didn't really mean to do it, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I went and rammed his car on, you know, uh, on uh, one of the Malibu Canyon roads. Um, and all I really wanted to do was destroy his axle. I didn't mean to kill him, even though he sold me that lemon of a car that cost me 10 grand or whatever. You're looking at that as a juror. Where are you coming out on this? Are you thinking it's first degree murder? Are you thinking it's second degree murder? What's your sort of take? And so I do a lot of these in class because the first question was, What's the right answer? The second question is, what do you think? And that gives us an opportunity to sort of sort between correct answer and possibly correct answers or, you know, what, what's the difference? What, where's the difference in your analysis? How are you walking through this process? And especially in law and in many of our classes, there is not always one correct answer. Um, an interpretation on, a, on, a, on a, a character's disposition and some story that they have to read. Um, in math, it's different, right? But in many of our uh, liberal arts or social science type disciplines, the way we get to the answer, uh, is, there's not exactly a, a correct answer. It's more of a what do you think? And it's helpful to show the students, well, what does everybody else think? And so here, the, the class's judgment about what they personally think should be the outcome seem to have influenced their, their judgment about what could have been the outcome. And so that tells us something. It tells us, if I'm training lawyers, it tells me to say to them, hold on a second. Separate your analysis of what could be charged from what you could actually prove. This is an important distinction for them to recognize because they need to realize that in any lawyering situation, they'll be the prosecution, and no matter what they personally think, someone on the other side is going to have a very different argument. If I'm defense counsel, this is reckless manslaughter. I'm saying, yeah, he, sh he should have known better. He, in fact, I might try put for negligent homicide. I'll say he should have known better, but he didn't mean to kill the guy. Believe my client. And if nothing else, he obviously didn't go out intending to kill someone. Yeah, it was risky. He, he knew that ramming someone could cause this. He shouldn't have disregarded that risk. He was merely reckless. He didn't intend to kill. He didn't plan to kill. And now I can convince them that, like, wow, I need to be ready for that argument from the other side, but I also need to figure out if I'm the prosecutor here, how do I maximize the facts that lead us to believe that this is first or second degree murder? I couldn't have that conversation. I've had that conversation. I've taught criminal law uh, 11 times now. Uh, it's so much easier to have the conversation after I get where everybody's at because I can pull them into the counter argument. If I was spending all day telling everyone why this was reckless manslaughter, they're all going, dude, I agree with you. I need to focus on what's the best argument for first degree. Because nobody in this room thinks that it's first degree murder. Even though this guy followed the car, found out where he was, went up onto the roadway, rammed the car on a canyon road, nobody here thinks that maybe that was pre-planned. What would it turn on? This is the next sort of learning point I can do, which is, 
What if the jury believes his statement that he didn't mean no harm? What's the highest level offense he could be convicted for? Or what if the jury, I could change this around? What if the jury disbelieved his statement? So based on last year's knowledge, um, I would change this slide. Or based on, let's say you guys were the last year's class. When I came in here, instead of saying what's the highest level uh, offense he could be convicted for if the jury believed him, knowing now that you are all believing him and are in reckless territory, I would say what if the jury disbelieved him? What's the highest level offense he could be convicted for? But let's just answer this question here. Um, so what's the highest level offense he could be convicted for if the jury believes him? Um, and again, you, if you answered one, you can actually change your answer to three. So it's whatever answer you put, the last button you hit before I close polling. So I'm waiting on two more people. Wait for it. And maybe they went to the bathroom or something, so we'll just move on. So now, we all get sort of, we get to the right answer, but look what happened. I lost some of these people. These people who are over here now say, listen, if the assumption is that the jury believes I didn't mean no harm, then I, they've moved into this camp. And so these people here, this is actually the incorrect answer to this question. Because if the jury believes he didn't mean any harm, then he couldn't have intended the killing and he couldn't have planned the killing and therefore we're not in second degree or first degree category. Maybe I have some lawyers in the room who know there are other forms of first and second degree murder, but based on the simplistic way in which I've set this up, you have to, if the jury believes him, you have to conclude reckless uh, manslaughter. If they take his statement, his self-serving statement at face value. So this lets me make a departure now. So now I say to them, in a in a book, you'll just get the statement, I didn't mean no harm. But in real life, you will get witnesses that have credibility issues. And so the person who says, yeah, I didn't mean any harm, whatever, is a lot less credible than the person who is crying on the stand. And they're distraught, this, this is horrible, I didn't mean any harm. And so all of a sudden, now the student connects this to, whoa, even with the same statement, there might be a difference in believability and that will impact the jury. Now I'll tell you that at, for this class, so for my crim law class, I've made lessons and learning objectives for the semester and then I've made lessons and learning objectives for each individual class. So at the end of this class, I expect that they know the difference between the definitions of homicide and they understand the impact of those definitions on how, um, on how the burden of proof applies and how it might affect the outcome of a case. With this, with those, having set those objectives, now I can test myself and say, for assessment, how does this tie into assessment or accreditation? Can I say, so if an accreditor came in and said, Greg, how do you know that you're training lawyers to understand the elements of homicide offenses and how the burden of proof interacts on that? I can say, well, you know how I know? Because I ask a bunch of questions based on our readings and we have discussions about it, and I can tell you that 70% of my class walks out getting that reckless manslaughter, uh, what reckless manslaughter means when weighed against a burden of proof and a non -credible or, and a credible witness. And I can tell you that I'm trying to get that number higher. And so next year, if I know that I'm at, if I'm at 70% this year, next year I'm going to try and make sure I'm at 75, 80, 100% of my students walking out getting that. And so I spend a little time on it. But if I'm at 100%, I don't waste the time. There are other issues. There's always something that people aren't going to understand. That's all for me, right? All about me. What about the student? Now if I'm this student, I'm thinking to myself, oh, I just blew it. I misread the question. Or maybe they're going, I really don't get it. The guy's really a murderer. And now they go, I'm so different than the rest of the class. And they come to office hours and they say, Professor McNeil, why was I so different? What didn't I get? I say, well, walk me through what you were thinking. And they say, well, you know, I looked at it and I thought, you know, that he planned it out and he really was the guy. I said, okay, well, hold on, though. What do the facts tell you? That they should believe it, that the jury believes him. But I don't believe him. It doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what the jury believes. And they go, ah, I get it. I missed that. I thought you wanted to know what I know. You want to know how I think based on the facts that you're giving. You wanted me to think critically. You didn't want me to regurgitate what I knew or what I thought. You wanted me to analyze it. And so that helps these. Even when they get it wrong, it helps them. This isn't part of their grade. This is just bringing them along on the, this sort of learning journey. Um, so there's the right answer, quote unquote right answer, right? So now, 
Here's a, this is called a comparative slide. So the first slide, second slide, distinction here. So uh, this is uh, anything in green was what do you think? Anything in light green, uh, that the place it pulls the graphics from is whatever uh, template you happen to use on PowerPoint. So um, my PowerPoint template's lots of greens and that's why it's all green. Um, you could choose a different template to have different colors. Uh, so here now we can have the same discussion. I say now look at the difference, look at the impact. When I asked you what you thought, 65% of you if you were jurors would have said this guy is guilty of reckless manslaughter and a full 29% of you would have put this person in, in second degree murder category. But when I said this person's believable, they're contrite, they're crying, whatever it is, the jury believes this person, look at how it shifts. 70% of you move to reckless manslaughter and only 15% of you are in second degree and a bunch of you thought just accident. Move down to that category from 6% to 10%. So two, two people in this class moved into the reckless, uh, into the negligent homicide category. So you can compare this stuff, change the assumptions and say, what did you do in one place? What did you do in another place? Uh, what, anybody know what time this session ends? 11 to 5. Okay, good. All right, so now, this is a really cool one. I didn't think I would get to it. All right, so you can do lots of multiple choice poll questions. You can do lots of um, uh, uh, graph questions. You can do Likert scale type things. For, uh, and you, so you can do true false. You can do a Likert scale. You can even do short answer questions. These are all features that you can uh, get through the turning software. This is one of the ones that I think is the coolest. So you're going to listen to an audio tape of a man who calls into 911 and at the end of it, he kills, a, he kills two people. Uh, and I play this for my students like early in the semester and you watch people's jaws drop because it's a shocking audio tape. Um, later on in the semester, I circle back to it once they know something about the law and I want them to, as they're listening, say, do I think this person's a murderer? They intended to kill? Or was it more likely that he was operating under the heat of passion? Or was it more likely that he was acting in self-defense or defense of property? Or do I just think there's no crime at all here? And what's amazing is that as the audio plays, usually the opinion of the students change. So what will happen is at any point in time, if all of you hit one right now, or five right now, uh, if you start hitting five on your clicker, um, I should get a polling result that happens live. Um, there it is. So all of you are at five right now. No matter how many times you hit it, you're just at five. So you can't hit the button. It's not a, a Nintendo game where you jump a lot and you can earn a lot of coins. You know, you're at five right now. You're all at murder right now. As the, so if, uh, if a couple of people start hitting three, this will start to drop. And this gives me the average view of the class of where we think whatever it is, is at at that point in time. Sort of like those uh, who's winning the debate commercial things. So now let me play the tape and we can just kind of watch how this plays out. So let's, I'm not sure what will happen with the audio. 911, what is your emergency? Uh, Burger's breaking into a house next door. What's the address there? 7418, not my address, but next door, okay? So where are you at now? Is there a crime? Did, did the caller commit a crime? And what you're really listening for uh, is... Uh, uh, do you want me to stop it? Nope. Don't do that. Uh, I'll probably leave somebody over, okay? Well, they're breaking in right now. They're in their house. Mm -hmm. I'm watching them. What color is the house they're breaking into? It's uh, kind of a red brick. Right next to a two-story uh, brick on my home. And the real question we're at assessing right now is, what is the 911 caller's mental state with regard to the killing that we know is about to occur? And so right now, are you thinking, am I listening to a person who has a mental state of wanting to kill someone? Or am I listening to someone who's concerned about defending property or self-defense or is passionate? It's amazing how this will, you will see this change over time. So let me, uh, oh no, what did I do? Okay, sorry. I have to, so sometimes one thing that happens is that when you, uh, when you exit out of things, it, um, yeah, it starts over, so you have to be careful, and I was not careful. Um, so how do I reopen my polling? Uh, is Chris here? Yeah. How do I reopen polling? There we go, thanks. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna, let me keep playing from where we left off, or I'll get further in. And you're at what address, please? I'm at 7418 Timberline. They are next door. You know the number next door? 
So now, I mean, if you're a student who's never heard this kind of stuff before, like, remember uh, uh, Daryl talked about you can be a passive watcher of a video, let's say, or an active. This turns you into the active watcher or yeah, listener. Standing in front of my house, okay, looking at it from the street, it'll be the left hand house. You got that? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm not hanging up, but I'm telling you right now, I don't like this kind of stuff, man. This is ridiculous. Yes, sir, it is. Broad daylight. I don't know if they're on or not. I know they got a crowbar, but that's what they broke in the windows with. So now you're listening to facts, and it's changing, right? Maybe it's uh, self-defense. On the side where the gate is, I mean, you know, where the fence is, because nobody can see them. I'll the right-hand side, looking from the front. So what I try to explain to the students is, Man, this is scary. I can't really say this neighborhood. these are the real facts that you would well, deal with. This is scary. I can't believe this would happen in this neighborhood. <laughs> Did you hear that 911 operator in the background? <laughs> no, I'm seeing where they went in the house. I can't see in the house. You can see where they entered in? Yes. I can't see the front. I can go off the front, but I'll go out the front. I'm bringing a shotgun with me, I swear to God. Okay. I'm not going to let him get away with it. I can't take a chance of getting killed with this, okay? No. I'm going to shoot. I'm going to shoot. Stay inside the house and don't go out there, okay? I know you're pissed off and I know what you're doing, but it's not worth shooting someone over this, okay? I don't want to, but I mean, if I go out there, you know, see what's going on, you know, what's going on. So I'm amazed that everyone's still at. Um, Self-defense and not passion I at point, you know, at point. Can you see anything out in the front of the house that, like a vehicle that came in or anything? No. I'll tell you that depending on where I do this example, I, when I did this in Seattle, I got very different results than with the students at Pepperdine. Um, my Seattle students were, were, were very anti-law enforcement, um, saw, listened to this and thought, angry white guy in Texas who wants to kill people. Um, my Pepperdine students largely were like, this is, you know, yeah. I mean, we were at like, we're at like the two line for, for a long period of time. Uh, it's, I mean, it's amazing, um, the difference. Um, and at Penn State, I'd get a good mix. Um, you know, you'd, it's just surprising results. And that, that, uh, that provides an opportunity for discussion. Like, why does this class collectively not, hasn't gotten to the murder point yet when this guy says, I've got a shotgun. I'll go out there. You don't, we're not at intent to kill? What does that tell us about jury pools? What does that tell us about our own biases that we might bring to the table, which is just a great opportunity for discussion. So this video, this audio has uh, four minutes left in it. And this is my last example. If people have to leave, feel free. I understand. Um, but it's got about four minutes left. So what's cool about that part, the comment he just made about knowing the neighbors really well, is that under Texas law, the only way you could defend the property of a neighbor would be if they gave you permission to do so, then you could invoke the castle doctrine. So there, if you were law students, you, when you heard, I don't know those people well at all, you would have to move off of defensive property if that's where you were at, um, because you were not given permission to defend the property. So it's just an interesting little nugget that comes and up. Has yeah. also been changed in this country since September 1st, and you know that I know it. Uh, I had a right to protect myself. Uh, and if God's under the legal weapon, it's not an illegal weapon. No, it's not. I'm not saying that. I'm all right. No, I'm wanting you to, you know. Okay, he's coming out the window right now. I gotta go, baby. I'm sorry, he's coming out the window. No. So keep voting, keep voting. Mr. Horn, do not I'm sorry. This ain't right, buddy. You're going to get yourself shot if you go outside that house with a gun. You want to make a bet? Okay, stay in the house. They won't get in the way. That's all right. Property is not worth killing someone over. Look, we're at passion. Collectively. 
you're pissed and you're frustrated, but don't do it. They got a bag of loot. Okay. How big is the bag? They're carrying a bag. Just a hand. Up. They're walking out about a hand hook. Yeah. Yeah. Which way are they going? I can't. I'm going outside. Uh, right now. No. <laughs> Why don't you go outside, Mr. Horner? Well, here we go, baby. You hear the shotgun clicking, I'm going. No. Go outside. This is where young faces' jaws drop. So, um, it's a little dramatic. I don't think anybody walks out of that class. First, I doubt anyone is surfing the internet um, in that class. Um, I don't think anyone walks out of that class not feeling like, I've had students come up to me afterwards shaking. I've had students come up to me saying, I didn't really get that this was real until I listened to that and how I have to put it together. And so they walk away saying, there were so many things going on. How would I know how to do this? Because he says they came right at me, but I don't know if I believe him because he said, I heard the shotgun clicking and I'm going. And then I add in the other factors. The two people who were killed uh, were both former felons here illegally, had been convicted on drug crimes. And do you think, class, collectively, you think we're somewhere between voluntary manslaughter and murder? If you indicted, do you think you would get and in, you think you'd get charges against this person if you indicted them? You think you'd get an indictment from a grand jury in Pasadena, Texas, a jury of his peers? And do you think that you'd get a conviction? And then I show them the news clip that he wasn't even charged with a crime. He walks out, no crime whatsoever, never even sits in court. Grand jury sits, listens, says that was his right, no crime there, wasn't even a trial. And the students walk out and go, wow. Not what I thought. And they also walk out of this going, wow, the facts are really crazy. And now, because I post the PowerPoint slides immediately to courses, they can listen to this video over and over again and play it through. And one year, um, when I didn't have the polling, I just had them listen to the, so to the audio, I gave them the, so this is like day you know, 14 in the semester or whatever, for their exam, I gave them the transcript of this exact call and said, what, what crimes could you charge and what are the weaknesses and strengths in it? And I was amazed even then at, like, we went through, we spent a whole class on it, and still I got a pretty distributed uh, uh, curve. I couldn't do this um, without having some technology. I'm not trying to be a proselytizer here. Uh, I'm probably preaching the choir anyway, but um, pretty powerful tool. Anyway, so all this can be exported into reports, which uh, Chris will happily tell you about at the lunch session on how to do reports. Every piece of information that you sent to me I can now export into an Excel spreadsheet. What answer did you give? Did you change your answer a few times along the way, which will tell me maybe you changed your answer because of something I said? I can aggregate it. I can get a, a, a pie chart of how many students got it right and wrong. I can find out how many men or women got it right or wrong, how many Seaver people versus uh, business people versus law people got the questions right or wrong. And I can aggregate that over the course of the semester so that at the end of the year, I know for certain how I'm doing class to class and over the course of an entire semester. 
Pretty cool stuff, if you ask me. I went over my time. I'll stick around for Q&A. Thanks for being a patient audience. I hope it was fun. Um, so now in the background, all I did was click Generate Report. And um, for those of you who are sticking around, instantly, this is my Excel spreadsheet with the report. Uh, who's affiliated where? Um, who got, uh, you know, who answered what with these questions? Uh, and then in my lower tab here in the bottom, I can do a demographic comparison. Um, but because I didn't associate your names in my slide with what school you were at, this slide's blank because I don't have demographic data. But had I coded what school are you with, I would now get answers on how men, women, business, students, second years, third years are doing on these, on these questions, all by predetermining the things I might want to know about. We, uh, we initially, when I started doing it last year, uh, and one other professor was doing it, had the students buy them at the bookstore. Um, then partway through the semester, um, working with my great IT team and the university, we got a grant to buy them back from the students, and we now own them and they sign them out and turn them back in and we take on responsibility for sort of like battery changes and maintenance and things like that. If they lose them, they're out 40 bucks. Um, but that way, the, we, we, we take on that administrative burden which makes it much easier for the students and now they're, I, there's, a, there's a, a whininess that's taken out of it, I mean, to be very honest, right? If they're being given it, now it's not a hassle, now they're willing to come and show up and be a part of it. Um, so that, that's how we handle it.